This interview is part of the SSEA Circumnavigator Summit, sharing experiences of members who circumnavigated. All engaged in this project are volunteers providing information solely for entertainment and education purposes. SSCA may edit and publish the interviews in the SSCA Circumnavigation Summit in audio and video formats to benefit its membership and as a recruiting tool. SSCA and participants assume no responsibility for the accuracy or validity of information shared in these interviews. Opinions stated do not necessarily reflect those of the Seven Sea Cruising Association. Hello everybody and welcome to the SSCA Circumnavigators Summit. My name is Jackie Lee from Trimoran Sloopmoosh and I have the privilege to interview some of these special members who have completed a circumnavigation. Many volunteers at SSCA are working hard to make the organization new and fresh and relevant to our members. So we hope you will enjoy this new series. Many sailors wonder what it takes to make a circumnavigation and whether they could do it. We will be interviewing SSCA members who did it. Believe it or not, over 100 members sailed around the world just in between the period between 2001 and 2019. And bravo to them. You will have a chance to hear many varied types of sailors. Solo sailors, families, two to three year voyages, 20 plus years, international members, former SSCA board members, motor vessel owners, celebrities, and regular sailors just like us. So, without further ado, let's get right to the interview. Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, Circumnavigator Summit interview with the boat Aquabi and the owners Bruce and Pam Dage who took their dogs, well one, in, one after the other, starting with a dog named Skipper and ending with a dog named Zach, around the world is going to be interesting because the phone call will emphasize how it was to circumnavigate with pets and whether when the problems arose or when it was a breeze and the different issues of having pets aboard. So without further ado we'd like to introduce Bruce and Pam Dage. Welcome Bruce and welcome Pam. Hello. Hi everybody. It's so good to speak with you again. It's been a long time. We did meet Bruce and Pam Pool. How long ago was it? It was in the Caribbean. It was before Bruce so, yeah. was a scuba diver. I remember we were instructors at that time and I think we talked something <laughs> about doing scuba lessons but somehow it never worked out. And we had this great interest uh, to be friends because we also had a pet and they were the same breed, the Skipper Key Dogs which are champion dogs for boats. We love them and uh, I think it's they're one of the greatest kind of dogs to have on board. And briefly tell us Bruce and Pam your backgrounds and how you got into boating and sailing. Well we both grew up in Iowa and after we got married in college we um, got a small boat and sailed it in the lakes in Iowa eventually getting into uh, Hobie Cat sailing. And uh, eventually as our careers moved us around, we ended up in New Jersey and we decided to get a larger boat. And at that time we got about a 42 foot uh, boat and uh, sailed it around Long Island Sound. And uh, that's, that was kind of the origins of it. Well, the real origin is Neither one of us really done any boating before. And in the February of uh, 71, I think it was, I was working in the library uh, trying to make ends meet. 
for financially and got assigned a periodical room and I had a couple minutes left at the end of my shift and said well I'm not going to go back downstairs yet and picked up the last magazine I had shelved and it was a yachting magazine with a West Sail 32 on it <laughs> and that nailed me. I went checked out and went up into the stacks and brought home about two feet worth of books all the classic circumnavigator books, how to build uh, boats, how to learn sailing, and uh, th put it on the table and said, Pam, look what I found. And that was the day that uh, my dream, a dream was born. Okay, wonderful. When you got your first larger boat and started sailing on the ocean, did you plan at that time to circumnavigate or have a little inkling in your mind that you might do that? Oh, yeah. the inkling in our mind uh, started back in February of 72. The boat I bought uh, when we moved to New Jersey was the boat we thought we were going to use to go around the world with. Oh, well, to go sailing with. Our intent to start with was just to go sailing. We didn't have really a, an agenda. We were going to do it till we weren't having fun anymore. And so I, I bought that boat, and we sailed it up and down the East Coast from Norfolk, uh, Virginia, to uh, Boston, and uh, through the Long Island Sound and whatnot on vacations, and thought that was going to be the boat we were going to use until we got stuck out in the Atlantic Ocean for 24 hours in gale force winds that was unpredicted at the time. And sitting down inside the boat trying to be comfortable and watching all the workings of the boat, I uh, said, this isn't the boat for me. I didn't think it was going to be structurally ready. And uh, so I worked with uh, Ted Brewer and designed the second Aquabi. We named both boats Aquabi and uh, did it with a steel hull, aluminum deck, and uh, high strength as you can imagine. <laughs> so, uh, and we started construction of that boat in uh, 1990. In 93, it was supposed to be completed, or in 92, and we arranged with the company we worked with to do a two-year uh, sabbatical, and the boat builder that I had hired wasn't anywhere near close to done by the time the sabbatical would have started. So we canceled that, and uh, I took over the boat building as a, as a general contractor, and then uh, when it was mostly done, we shipped it to where we lived in New Jersey, and I finished up all the systems in it and stuff. That would have been 93 when we did that, and then in 96, uh, the company both offered us a uh, a package to leave and they offered it to everybody in the company so when we took it they couldn't not let us have it and it uh, filled up our uh, cruising kitty and allowed us to go. Hey my gosh from uh, taking a stack of magazines in the library to actually finishing off <laughs> a boat for yourself by yourselves uh, that's uh, pretty amazing uh, it must have taken a lot of inspiration for you. And you mentioned the name of Aquabi, that they both had that name, and I, before the interview started, I asked you about that name, and I would like for you to tell the listeners what the name meant and why it meant a lot to you. Okay, um, Aquabi is a Sioux Indian word. Us being from Iowa, it's kind of appropriate, and it means meeting place on the water. And there's a lake near where Pam grew up called Lake Aquabi. And after we started this dream, and we were, were driving around where she grew up, and we saw this lake, and I learned what the uh, meaning of the word was and stuff, and I said, that's going to be the name of my boat. <laughs> and... Uh, Hence, that's what uh, we did. A great name for an SSCAer, 
to have a meeting place on the water uh, because that's the kind of thing that we do. The boat was finished and you got some kind of package in 96 that you couldn't refuse. So is 96 the year that you would say you started your circumnavigation? Like I said earlier, we didn't really go out with the intent of doing a circumnavigation. We were going to go sailing and, and with the intent of going lots of places till we got tired of it. It ended up being a circumnavigation because that's the way to get the boat home. But, uh, <laughs> but that was when we started because we, you know, we sold the house, everything, and uh, took off. Okay. 96. 96. Okay, that's when you got to be the live aboard. All right, 96. And yeah, it happens a lot that many of the people that we've spoken to, it's kind of like a comes to be an accidental circumnavigation <laughs> or we're just out here sailing and then uh, at some point it goes, well, why not? You know, and that's good. Let's just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how many years did you consider it took you to do the circumnavigation? Well, we crossed our outward path in 2006 when we uh, came back to the Caribbean. It was about 10 years between when we left in 96 and we came back in 2006. All right. And uh, the general route that you took was uh, going westward around? Right. We did the basic uh, coconut milk run to New Zealand and then went back up to uh, Vanuatu and Fiji and over to Australia. And then from Australia, we diverted from the normal path. We went back to Vanuatu, up to the Solomon Islands, spent a, uh, quite a while in the Solomon Islands. At the time, they were having a kind of a little civil war, but there was peace while we were there, so we timed that perfectly. And then we went on up to uh, Micronesia, Palau, and the Philippines. So from the time we okay. left Vanuatu till we got to the Philippines, we probably saw three or four other cruising boats, and that was a period of almost a year. And then when you got to... Um Asia and that, did you decide you were going up the Red Sea or did you go South Africa? We decided to do the Red Sea and this would have been in uh, 2003 is when we did it and we had some concerns about doing it because of the, uh, Pirates. the pi piracy and also the uh, United States involvement with Iran. Ah, uh, yeah. Or Iraq, I mean. But uh, we spent about a year and a half in uh, the Southeast Asia between um, Thailand and Malaysia, and we did some land trips inward and had a great time. Then when we left, we went to uh, the Maldives, down to Chagos. We spent four months in Chagos, um. which was an absolutely spectacular experience. And then uh, from there, most people would go the northern route up to the Sea of Aden. And we went over to the Seychelles, down to Madagascar, did uh, uh, Tanzania and Kenya, and our piracy uh, plan was to sail offshore during the southwest monsoon from Kenya up to the Sea of Aden, and uh, that worked really well because the winds were blowing 25 to 35 knots. It was straight down wind, so I could put two head sails out and use the wind vane. Very comfortable sailing. And we were making seven, eight knots most of that time. And the seas were so rough, the pirates at that time were using native boats, so they weren't very strong. And we didn't see anybody out there. And at that time, the piracy thing was a... Uh, an, uh, incident of, of opportunity if 
they were smuggling people over across the Sea of Aden or various places, and if they saw a boat, they would attack it. But they didn't really go after boats until the year after we went by. Okay. Yeah, all right. So good timing and good strategy. When your skipper key came aboard, was he at the very beginning with your boat, or did he join later on? Skipper was... Uh, Part of our family, I got him as a puppy about two years before we left. And the way I picked a skipper key was I studied all the breeds. And the skipper key being a boat dog to start with uh, was uh, raised or bred to work the barges in Belgium. I figured he'd be a pretty good match. And it turned out to be really great. He adapted to the boat very quickly. Uh, he was a little stubborn at first about uh, doing his thing up on the deck, but we had an AstroTurf mat set up. And uh, once he learned to do that, then it was no problem. Once he had to go, he'd go, and then after that, it was no problem at all. Okay, great. <laughs> That's nice. That's uh, sort of the same way we, pr we uh, chose our skipper key, because... They're boat dogs and Belgian, you know, with Luke being Belgian, we had to, we had to get one of those. <laughs> and they are, they are great boat dogs. So that's wonderful. Okay, so Skipper came on board uh, when he was about two years old and adapted very nicely. Okay, when he was uh, on the, the new boat that you got, did he... Uh, find it pretty easy to adapt? Did he, ha did he have um, ways to jump in and out by himself or did he, was it uh, a long ways down from the companion way to the soul or how did he do? We, we taught him. We actually taught him how to climb the companion way steps. So as long as we weren't in rough seas, he would climb right up those steps and then he would he, he found a way to jump down into the seat and come back in. So he did real well. He, and we actually come up with a, a doggy door for the companionway door so that when we left him on the boat, he could you know, come and go on his own. Oh, that's good. When you were on passage, how, did you have a, a lead for him or a, a way to tie him? And did he stay Yeah, open? we kept him into the cockpit. He did not like to go down below when we were on a passage because, you know, he had no way to grip anything and he'd just slide around on the floor. But uh, he loved them. He loved the passages because, of course, he got to be with us 24 hours a day <laughs> <laughs> in the cockpit. So yeah. he, he was always team. He didn't like foul weather, of course. I guess they read us or he was just uncomfortable when it was raining or something. But uh, yeah. But he was a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're funny, and, and it's funny to see their sea legs when the boat, when the boat, kind of heels over, and how they they just sort of like move back and forth <laughs> with the boat. Yeah. It's, it's it's fun to watch them. Do you remember how you heard about the SSCA and when you joined SSCA? I think we were members for a number of years. Long time before we left. Before we left. We probably read about it in a sailing magazine, I suppose. Yeah, it uh, seems to me I remember reading about it in a sailing magazine and said, well, check this out. And uh, the stories and uh, the advice helped form our plan. And uh, it was really valuable. Yeah, we saved them, you know, in the old pre-technology days. We had the whole stack of the, of the bulletins and we would thumb them frequently on our on our first halfway around the world and then we got the discs and didn't have to keep the paper anymore. Right. Yeah, we would go through them and tear out the pages where we say, okay, we're going to those areas and make little highlights and all kinds of stuff like that. Do you have any kind of a story that you remember that somehow relates to SSCA or meeting an ssca -er or... Um, going on a GAM or anything? 
Yeah, we went to some of the rallies, and we met, especially when we first left. Uh, I remember going to some rallies in uh, Maine. in Maine and in Annapolis, and of course we met a lot of people that we continued to meet again uh, throughout our trip through the Caribbean. Anyway, yeah, that's always the fun. The fun part is meeting the people that you have the common the common bug and always talking about systems on board and batteries and energy and and that sort of thing getting together and it's always fun to run into uh, boats again and have uh, that camaraderie that we all like to share. You did have some bad weather when you were first uh, learning to sail and uh, with your first boat, which convinced you not to keep that one for going around the world. Um, so afterwards, with that, or do you want us to tell that story of how you got there? And, and I admire you that afterwards you still wanted to continue after a bad weather story like that. You still wanted to continue and eventually you went around the world. Did you mostly have good weather after that and what did you um, have any other bad weather stories and how did Zach handle or at that time Skipper or Zach handle it? Okay well in that situation uh, we learned a, a really valuable lesson don't have a schedule because <laughs> the reason we were out there in that nasty weather is because we both had meetings two uh, days later uh, that we had to be at that work so we were pushing to get back and had we not had that we would have turned around gone downwind pulled into uh, it happened to be Atlantic City which was a safe entrance and uh, waited for the storm to go by so number one lesson don't have a schedule and uh, we had done quite a bit of sailing at that point uh, you know we were five or six years into the bigger boat and when we pulled into a fuel dock that we spent the night at after finally uh, getting in a safe place we kind of crashed out and woke up this morning, uh, the next morning, and we both kind of said to each other, that wasn't fun, but we can still do this. <laughs> so you know, that, that was a, a, a real good test that we were going to be able to accomplish what we wanted to do, that we could handle the weather. And as far as other weather, uh, I get this question when I tell people that, you know, I've sailed around the world, they, one of the first questions everybody asks is about weather. Right. And I tell them that, uh, like everything in life, your experiences add up, and things that we experienced as what we think would be moderate weather, somebody who hasn't had that experience would think it was absolutely terrible. So... It's real hard to say to somebody that, you know, I didn't have bad weather because for them it would have been bad. For me, it wasn't so bad. But the most memorable was when we were sailing from uh, Tonga to New Zealand. Um, we got, after we left Tonga and committed to going to New Zealand, a horrible storm developed in front of us, and we stopped in those islands. Um, I can't remember the name of them. <laughs> yeah, but there was the a reef. whole reef. The reef. reef, yeah. And there was a whole group of us. There must have been 20 boats, and we all slipped into Minerva Reef and set out the storm. Uh, but others who did not, there was some people who lost their lives in that storm. Oh, but wow. after we left Minerva Reef, we had a pleasant enough sail down to New Zealand at that point. So... Again, it was the not having a schedule and listening to the weather people, and, and we didn't really have any problems. Right. Uh, we were told by the weather people in New Zealand when we left Minerva, they said, you have a three-day window, and there will be another storm after that. So all of us 
on them uh, that were there left. I think a couple people stayed with the intention of staying longer. But uh, we all made it in. And then there was one guy who left two days after us. Oof. And he lost his uh, boat because the storm was so bad. He actually had to get rescued by a freighter. And, and his partner. And, and his, his partner was lost in the process. Oh. So, you know, if, if there's one lesson I will pass on to the folks is listen to the weather guys and don't have a schedule. Right, yeah. One of the places that's infamous in our cruise, in the cruising around the world gang and everyone is always uh, tense about that passage to and from New Zealand because it seems like you're going to get whacked either in the beginning or at the end or you're going to get whacked somewhere in that passage. So the best advice uh, that you gave us was listen to the weather people because they know the patterns and they've advised so many people going through that those passages and that's the thing to do and don't try to outguess them okay that's good advice so um when in your voyaging did you uh did skipper skipper passed away from old age and and then you got a new puppy so tell us about that story okay uh it was at the end of our circumnavigation. We were in uh, Panama, and Skipper was getting old. He caught some fungus because the uh, area in Panama was so uh, oh, humid, yeah, so moist. And we had uh, gone back to Iowa uh, to visit our folks. And I know there's a question later about our schedule for doing that. But we were there for about a month or a month and a half and during that time uh, Skipper had started having seizures and strokes, strokes and uh, we had to uh, put him down he was uh, he was pretty measurable so our by, plan by that time he was had, lot, he had cataracts and couldn't see and couldn't hear and it was it was time yeah and uh, our plan at the time was uh, to go a year without a dog. That lasted maybe two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so being in Iowa with the Internet uh, being the, uh, available, uh, we got on the Internet and searched uh, skipper keys for sale, and we drove around for three days. We saw five different dogs and ended up with Zach. And Zach was about a seven-week-old puppy when we bought it. All right. So that was when you were back in the States. Yeah, we bought him back in the States, and then we, uh, flew, back, back flew, we flew back to Panama with him. And he got introduced to the boat as probably a nine- or ten-week-old puppy. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's a good time to do it. Communications. How did you, okay, did your communications evolve in different ways, like over the 10 years? Um, did you start out, say, I can't remember when we when we switched to uh, Pactor and that sort of thing, but how did your communications go, contacting folks back home and that? Well, I learned about uh, an operation that was called Pin Oak at the time, which was a Pactor based commercial operation and we started out with that and it was somewhat marginal in that they only had one and one or two antennas up and but we made use of it we put out position reports to our family and friends every day that we were cruising and we used that for you know small email and then uh when we got to Panama, we learned more about Pactor and the uh, and the ham radio support of it. And Pam took the time to learn code and took got her uh, amateur license. And uh, so we switched 
we had to have the pactor sent in or the the uh, pin oak modem sent in to be changed and we changed it over to the amateur one and dropped pin oak and uh, used that mostly the rest of the way around the world because uh, satellite uh, communication at that time was tremendously expensive and uh, this worked we could put out our uh, position reports and that everything was fine and uh, we were, this had also allowed a little longer to email so that worked great and of course anytime we were in port we made use of internet cafes and stuff and uh, then at, toward the end of the trip there was uh, the ability to do to hit hotspots with your computer and uh, the internet. So it quite it had quite an evolution. And uh, my job before I uh, we went, I was involved in uh, setting up remote offices for uh, our workforce, and I was involved in trials for the internet before it was called the internet. So I've seen quite a progression in my uh, career. And <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, you know, we think when we, when we got the Pactor modem and we could do email via ham radio uh, and, or um, sale mail, I mean, that was so miraculous. And... Uh, what? Now, now mostly, I guess, uh, satellite satellite phones are much more affordable, and uh, so many places. Uh, when you're close to the islands, all you just get cell cell coverage and wireless and all those great things. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, um, let's go to another s area that you alluded to, and it's probably the second question that people ask you about when you go around the world and say, "What about pirates?" And uh, what about thieves? Well, we had a little black dog who just barked like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he pretty much kept, I think we never had any trouble with anything being stolen, and I think the dog played a big part in that. That uh, he is a, was, Skipper was a very good watchdog, and he would bark viciously if anybody came close to our boat. And um, so we never had any problems. The only time we ever locked ourselves in our boat at night was when we came back around and stopped in Margarita, Venezuela, and uh, things were pretty rough at that time, so that we did lock ourselves in at night there, you know, shut the companionway door and put a padlock on it, um, but we never had, any, nobody came on our boat, nobody boarded it, so we didn't right. have any problems, but that was the only time we were worried enough to do that. Okay. And uh, was your guard dog in or out at night? He was mostly in the boat, but you know his hearing was such that he could hear people coming. And some nights he'd sleep out. It was it kind of varied depending upon what he wanted to do. And uh, he loved sitting out on the deck just watching the world go by. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of how he, you know, the basis of his watching. But uh, back to uh, the piracy thing, I wanted to interject. Um, when we went up through uh, the uh, straits between Sumatra and uh, Malaysia, yeah. mm. we heard all kinds of stories about piracy. And we'd heard these stories for years before we got there. And when we get there and we're talking to the locals and stuff, we learn the customs from the uh, local fishermen. They have some pretty interesting ideas. And they're very superstitious people. And when they leave the dock to go fishing, they set off a whole string of fireworks, uh, yes. firecrackers, up in front of their boat. I'm sure you guys have witnessed it a number of times being there. Yeah. And the purpose of that is to scare away the demons. And if they're out fishing for two or three days and they haven't caught anything, they still have demons. 
<laughs> and they say, well, how can we get rid of the demons? So what they do is they find another boat, and they charge that other boat as fast as they can, right on, almost in as a broadside. And then they turn just before they hit it. And the demon can't turn as fast as they can, so the demon goes over the other boat. <laughs> Therefore, you have a whole bunch of people reporting an incident like that as piracy when there was no piracy. All and right. We never actually had that experience ourselves, but we heard it from a few other people. And the only time that the hair got up on the back of my neck, we were out in the Indian Ocean, and there was a guy come up pretty close, and I had a strategy that I'm not sure I should share. I kept in the, uh, in the cockpit, in the locker, I kept three bottles of gas. I am... These bottles, I scored them with a glass cutter and filled them with gas and corked them. Okay. And my strategy was if somebody got close enough that they were a threat, I would throw that bottle of gas, and I kept three of them on there in case I missed the first time, and I could throw that on their boat, and it would hopefully break when it hit. Right. And then I'd have my flare gun out there. Yeah. And as a mariner, your biggest fear in the world is fire. Right. Well, as soon as they smell that that gasoline, if they've got any brains in, their, in the world, they'll veer away. Right. I never had to deploy that, but I was ready to one time. And the guy come up and he held up the big fish and said, cigarettes. <laughs> so, <laughs> we waved him away. Or we waved him away. No, no. I don't, no FUMA is what it was the, ah. in that part of the world. And uh, he, he, he wanted to give us a fish. And I said, no, 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 I can't, you know, I don't have time to mess with it. I didn't want to, you know, have that opportunity. I just kept him away. Right. But that was the only time that really raised the hair on the back of our neck as far as uh, a piracy, quote unquote, incident. Right. So yes. Lots of stories out there. And you got to take them with a grain of salt. Right. Yes. And so many of so many of those uh, stories that we heard, where lots of people said, "Oh, the, the the boat was approaching, and it was a local boat." And when we turned, it turned, and and all of those things. And so many times, it ends up somebody wanting some water, or wanting some cigarettes, or having some fish to sell, or. And you think to yourself, if you had done something serious or harmful to them, you would have felt terrible. But okay, you can never know. So that's it's good. To, have, it's good to have a strategy, and it's good to you know just uh, keep your wits about you and let yourself judge those situations as they come. We were also extremely cautious about inviting any locals on board our boat. I know some of our friends would invite them on board at a drop of a hat, but we only very selectively let anybody on the boat so they couldn't, you know, scope it out or anything. I think that's so I would wise. That. Yeah, that that's wise. In some in some places where the people don't have much and some well meaning cruisers say, Oh, you know, we want to invite them on our boat and serve them this and show them that and Sometimes uh, you might be doing uh, yourself not a favor because they will see, oh wow, these people are rich and these people have this and these people have that and they don't have and they don't have much of anything at all. So it's best not to tempt the devil, as you say, until you get to know them, and then you select the yeah. people. That's that's a good yeah. advice, also. And, and one of the comments I would add to that is you do them a disservice by showing them something they can't have. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, the, in the Solomon Islands, uh, we, we had just anchored and there was these Trevellis jumping like crazy and right after we put the anchor down and I was about to lower the dinghy. To, to go out fishing and one of the guys come by and asked me real nicely if I had 
something he could fish with. And I tossed him my hand line, and he went out, he caught this trevally, must have been two or two and a half feet in diameter. And he brought back the fish line and put the fish on the deck, and he said, thank you. And I said, no, you need the fish. And we argued back and forth. He wanted me to have the fish because it was my line. And I told him, well, I wouldn't have caught it had you not come out and done it. And eventually we compromised. He took the fish home, uh, filleted it, and gave us a quarter of it, which was more than we could eat anyhow. (laughs) And he was happy, and we made an instant friend. So there are lots of opportunities to make friends. Yes. And that's great. That's a judicious way to do it. So I like that a lot. So another question people like to ask is, how do you sustain yourself financially when you're going around the world? Well, I've been asked that question many, many times. And my answer is, plan it. <laughs> we, were tw- we were 20 when the uh, idea came up. We finished college. After we graduated from college, our first uh, question was, are we going to go down to the Caribbean and be boat bummed for a couple of years and see if that's really what we want to do? Or are we going to start our career so we can go ahead and do that someday? And we decided to go ahead and do our career. And we, because of what we wanted to do, We didn't see kids fitting in, so we decided that we were not going to have any children. And we saved a minimum of 10% in many years, as much as 25% or even more of our gross income, and put it into investments. And with the plan that we'd have enough money to live off of during our cruise, and if we had to, we could, you know, always come back and work because we both had jobs that would carry back. Mm-hmm. And it uh, played out really well for us. Uh, we never wanted for money. And when we finally quit uh, because of the market that we'd been in and we invested strictly in passive mutual funds, and it did really well. And we haven't had to worry about it since. <laughs> All right. Um, but, you know, we, we did that for 25 years. Right. Okay. That is that is good. That's good planning. Some people will say, oh, how lucky you are, you know, or how lucky we are to be out there on the sea. Well, some of the luck was planned <laughs> luck. and Make uh, your own. Make your own luck. And uh, that's really good. With hindsight... Would you do anything differently? Not really. And, but I will share with you some insight from our perspective. Okay, when great. When we were down in the Caribbean, um, we'd meet couples that were 60 to 70 who had just retired and they got their boat and they were had fixed it up and were ready to go. And they'd ask us what we were doing, and we said, well, we're going through the canal next March uh, and going to run the coconut milk run for a while. And they said, oh, that was our dream. And I said, well, come on, let's go do it. And they said, not, not going to happen. And when I was 45, we were 46, 47 at that time, I really didn't understand what their problem was. I'm 69 now. And I absolutely understand what their problem was. <laughs> if, if you don't start out earlier doing the sailing, the uh, long passages and the challenges of living off of a yacht uh, get a lot more onerous. So had we kept sailing, we could be still. We could be doing it because we'd learned how, and all of our muscle memory and everything worked. But when you start, when you're 60 to 65, it gets to be a lot more challenge. So uh, my biggest encouragement, and what I'm really glad we did, is we did it early. 
What were some of the biggest highlights of your voyage? There are so many of them. <laughs> and, and I get this question all the time. You know, what was your favorite place? What was your you know, favorite thing? There is just so many things we did that, you know, if we were to do it without a yacht, it would cost you millions and millions of dollars to accomplish what we did. We went to places uh, uh, in Vanuatu. We went to a ceremony that had, it was a men's ceremony, and it was in Southwest Harbor. I don't remember the name of the, the island. But they had not, it was a men's society, and uh, they hadn't done any of their ceremonies or stuff, anything since World War II. And... Of course, many of the men were starting to get old and they were dying off and they wanted to save these traditions for the young people. And this little island, of course, had two or three guest cabins and that was it. And there was an outfit. It wasn't National Geographic's, but it was a photography outfit similar to them. They come in to document this. And we heard about it and there was about eight or ten of us on boats that uh, went over and said, you know, we'd like to, to witness this as well. And they said, well, we don't have any place for you to stay and we don't have extra food for you and stuff. We said, those boats out there are where we'll stay and we've brought our own food. And finally, after some negotiations, we, uh, gave, them 30 uh, we gave them 25 or $30 contribution to the school and they let us stay as long as we uh, behaved ourselves. And we only had one person that was asked to leave out of the whole bunch of us. But we did three days of ceremonies. And it's really interesting that uh, uh, they, they killed pigs and they have, uh, if you're familiar with the Masons, the Masons have 33 degrees in their progression through the masonry. Mm -hmm. Well, they had 33 degrees in their, or steps in their progression from being a young boy introduced to the society to being a elder leader in that society. And there was different kinds of ceremonies they went through with each one that involved raising pigs and killing pigs. And they had this thing decorated and it was just, and dancing and and uh, it was just spectacular. And that was probably one of the most memorable things that nobody else would get a chance to see. Mm -hmm. But we got to when we were out there. Yeah, that's amazing. That uh, yes, Vanu Vanuatu was one of those places that was definitely the highlight for us, and we did as much traveling as we could there and stayed five years. But yes, that's the, that's sometimes the chance. Um, so many stories of people on on sailing boats, cruising, that got to see these sorts of ceremonies and things that no one on a tourist uh, package or anything would ever witness. And definitely, the authenticity would not be the same. So that is a wonderful highlight. I'm going to say the memorable, we have a lot of good memories of the people, the native people we met as we traveled around the world. And then we have lots of good memories of all the wonderful cruisers that we met going around the world. And then there are the land trips that we took in the various places that is also quite memorable. So I, I kind of would divide them up into those three categories, but we have really wonderful experiences in all of them. What was your most memorable land voyage? We took a safari in Tanzania. Mm. One thing that impressed us about you, Bruce and Pam, were that was that after the circumnavigation, you continued to sail for quite a bit. And uh, so, what happened after the circumnavigation? Where did you sail? Okay, we... Uh well, we considered the circumnavigation to be completed when we crossed our outward path, which would have been in uh, Beckway. Beckway. And then we went back. Uh, we had gone the northern coast of South, uh, South America uh, 
Venezuela and Colombia. We went back through those areas and went up to Panama and spent a good deal of time in Panama and then went up through uh, the islands all the way up north. And uh, we spent, what, probably two years doing that? Yeah, so we completed the loop of circumnavigating the Caribbean. Okay. And uh, and so and then we went to uh, back to the states. We uh, checked in in uh, Key West. And the interesting story on the kind of going back to the piracy thing uh, when we were off the north coast of uh, Cuba, about twenty five miles. I kept my distance there. Um, in the middle of the night, there was this white light in front of us. And I figured it was a fisherman or something, so I changed course so I'd miss him. And the white light moved right in front of where I was going to go. So I changed course the other way, and the white light moved right where I was going to go. Mm. And when we were within a couple miles of this uh, white light that obviously was a boat, uh, somebody came on uh, Channel 16 and said, you can pull up to our right side. <laughs> and I got back on and I says, what? <laughs> he says, you can pull up to our right side. I says, you can go straight to you know where. Get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> and their lights went off. <laughs> and their lights went off. And they disappeared. <laughs> and they disappeared. <laughs> So you know what they were doing? <laughs> they, they thought we were going to come pick something up off their boat or drop something or off. drop something off. Not sure which. Oh <laughs> gosh! <laughs> Case of misidentification. The is, yeah, the funny thing is, when we got to, into uh, uh, Key West, we could have had the boat full of stuff, and nobody ever checked. <laughs> <laughs> And and, the, and we got in on a Friday, late afternoon, and we called up customs and stuff, and they said, "Well, come in on Monday." And so on Monday we walked, we went, walked in. Of course, we've been to shore a number of times before. They never said we couldn't. And uh, we go in and talking to the customs guy. He says, uh, "How long have you been out of the country?" And I says, "Oh, about eleven or." Well, 14 years, 13 years, however long it was. And uh, he said, uh, well, did you buy anything along the way? I said, duh. <laughs> of course we bought, I said, of course we bought things along the way. And he says, did you um, buy anything while you were gone? And, and I said, no. And he says, fine. <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted us to say no. He didn't want the real answer. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another fun experience. <laughs> so now I would like to get into more about having the dogs and uh, any of the. Okay, thinking back of going uh, around the world with the dog, would you say, what would you say would be. Um, some advice to people that were thinking about taking a pet around, like, do you say, I'll oh, just, you know, don't worry about it, uh, just uh, some places they won't let you take the dog ashore, but you can keep them on board, and some places there's no problem, and some places you have to maybe, like New Caledonia, you have to do a week of quarantine, or, okay, what kinds of uh, things would you say to somebody that that ask if I wanted to go around the world with a pet? Well, I would generally obey the local rules, whatever they are. Don't try to sneak it or or cheat on it. I would really, because then you could cause it problems for people down the road that if you cheated the next time, they're going to be stricter with the next boat. So I would really say try to obey the law as much as you can. Um, and I will also be... You know, you can tell from your dog whether that's, or cat or whatever you're going to take, whether this would work for them. You know, be attuned to the animal that you're thinking about taking. Is this fair to them? You know, we took a small dog that was actually bred to survive on a boat, so it 
didn't have any problems. But you'd see people with like black labs and stuff that really, really needed exercise. And to try to keep them on a, a boat when you can't go ashore for six months, that seems like it might be cruel, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But obviously people who had cats did just quite fine too. And parrots. And we heard lots of people have different experiences. But we really found the dog to be a great companion for us. Okay, was there yes, well, was there anywhere where you had uh, a big problem having a pet? Yeah, telephone all that story. Yeah. Um, well, the, the challenge there's two really challenging areas. One is the whole Pacific, because the whole Pacific is pretty much uh, uh, rabies fit free, and we had made the decision when we left Panama that the dog would not get off the boat if there was any population around. And uh, so he got off the boat maybe three times through the Pacific, and they were on little small atoll islands where he could go do some running and jumping and catch some rats and that kind of thing, which he loved to do. Uh, and then, uh, but we communicated with Australia and New Zealand because we knew that they were going to be a problem. And New Zealand said, if you do take, do these tests, and they were a number of tests that they had, and do it X number of months before you arrive, then it's a 30-day quarantine. Otherwise, it's a six-month quarantine. And Australia t told us, their answer was, we'll decide when you arrive how long the quarantine's going to be. And I wrote them back and said, you know, I really want to know what I have to do to make the quarantine as short as possible. And the answer was, we'll determine it when we arrive. Oh, boy. So uh, our plan was, when we were in uh, French Polynesia, we had the appropriate test done for the dog the rabies antibody tests and a couple of other tests and sent those to New Zealand. So when we arrived in New Zealand, they were there to meet us and uh, put the dog in a kennel and took it to quarantine for 30 days. And that was stressful for the dog. It was stressful for us because it was quite a ways away. Uh, they were in Auckland and we were in Fongare. Mm. And... But uh, we managed to get down there and visit him a couple of times. It was a good thing, too, because they didn't follow our feeding instructions, and he must have put on three or four pounds. <laughs> For an 18-pound dog, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but once he got out of that and he got readjusted to being with us it was absolutely no problem and when it came time for us to leave New Zealand uh, and we knew we were going to go to Australia we had met some folks on a farm in New Zealand who had a little boy who was a little bit autistic and uh, wanted to have a pet and we said well we'll leave and he got along with uh, skipper really well and we said well if you guys want we'll uh, leave skipper here while we go to the islands and then I'll have somebody a uh, service come pick him up and ship him to Australia and that they were thrilled with that and uh, so skipper got to have six months playing with a little boy and sleeping in his bed and everything which we wouldn't allow him to do. And uh, then we shipped him to Australia, and when we went to pick him up at customs, he, you could tell he wasn't in very good mood because he was growling with the customs guys. Finally, I, when I walked into the customs, I said, where's my dog? He just lit up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we handled the situation between New Zealand and, and Australia. Because at the time, I don't know what it is now, but uh, you could animals could go back and forth directly between the two, but not by boat. Ah, okay. Uh, so if he flew, then he could. He flew. They had agreement. They had agreements up. between New Zealand and yeah. Australia because they're so, both rabies free. Okay, yeah, all right. I remember that, that the story, yeah. 
Okay. And then the other challenge we had, uh, we, we did not plan on stopping in the Maldives. But when we were off the uh, coast of Sri Lanka, uh, the primer pump on my diesel engine gave out or quit, leaked. Uh, and yeah, we had been sailing in 15, 20 knot winds, and we got into the wind shadow of Sri Lanka, and the sails are slatting, and I went to start the engine, it wouldn't start. And long, long story short, the uh, the uh, injector or the uh, priming pump leaked, which leaked air into the system. Oh. And I finally got that fixed, but that meant we had to stop somewhere. And the Maldives had a, a diesel outfit. And so we had contacted a agent in the Maldives to take care of our clearance because you had to have an agent there. Right, yeah. It's one of like, two or three places we've been where you had to. And uh, we told the guy up front, we have a dog, because uh, they're a very strong Muslim country, and they do not allow dogs. Right. Over and I sent this over an email, and he sent back a response that says, well, make him sleep. <laughs> I am, basically. I am. Okay. And I said, I said, basically, no way in God's green earth am I going to hide him. So we put him in, the, in, we had a little uh, soft kennel for him, and we put him in that kennel when the officials arrived, and we told the officials up front that we have a dog, and he will stay on board. He does not need to go shore. And after they all kind of looked at him from a distance, and we got permission from one of them, and they all made note on the paperwork that there was a dog. <laughs> that there was a dog. Right. And so we ordered our part, and we had to go sit. They, they, took, they gave us a, a designated area where we could anchor, and we went over there and anchored and used the dinghy to go back and forth. And finally, when the, the uh, part arrived and we were checking out, the uh, agent, gave us all kinds of shit for having a dog. I said, hey, I looked, told you up front. And he got in all kinds of trouble, and he bad-mouthed us to everybody that came by after us uh, about what terrible people we were. Oh, God. But uh, he, he ended up getting a, a big fine, and he wanted us to pay his fine. Of course, we had left by then. So uh, I said, hey, we told you up front there was a dog on board. We told the officials. We told the officials there was a dog on board. The officials approved it. It's your fault that you got caught trying to tell us to, to hide it. <laughs> so right. apparently they had monitored emails of this guy, ah. and they saw that he had us to hide the dog. And so initially they thought we had hidden the dog, but then when we took them the paperwork and showed them, you know, oh. the notations right. that we had told all the officials about it. They said, fine, you're not in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but he still got fined, like, I don't know, 350 bucks or something, which, you yeah. know, I guess that's life. <laughs> you yeah. shouldn't tell people to hide their dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, okay. I that part of the story. Uh, that's good to be up, up front. on the radio said, you got to come to customs right away. And don't stop anywhere. We said, what in the heck's going on here? So we grabbed the paperwork and he was prepared for it. And that worked out good. <laughs> so there in our, uh, what we said before, we followed the rules. We, and we learned what the rules were ahead of time. And we followed them. And that saved us a whole lot of trouble in that time. And you try to leave a clean wake, you know, the seven seas policy there, so. Right, you're right. I think uh, that was a good good thing that you pointed out is that um, to be up straight and honest and following the rules as you go because people that that kind of cheat or they might they might get away with it and then they say he 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 and that sort of thing. But as you think about those who come after you, then it might be. Uh, 
very sad for them and they get in a bad situation and then we cruisers get a terrible name you know those boat people blah blah and that so that was very great listening to your stories and your adventures and one thing that I'm sure you'll agree with us is that one of the joys and highlights of cruising is the pet I mean our dogs we have never enjoyed cruising so much watching them enjoy <laughs> because their enthusiasm and then they're they're just the joyful way that they behave and and you see their especially skipper keys they're so interested in everything and they look and then and they they bark and then they're great to tell you if you catch a fish or anything like that we just have so much fun with them that uh, they made they made cruising a highlight for us and i'm sure it was the same with you and your dogs that's for sure. That's why it only lasted two weeks when the first one passed. <laughs> the idea of going back to the boat without a dog, just I just couldn't stand that idea. <laughs> right. Okay, so thanks so much for the uh, great interview. And for the last thing, are there any parting words of wisdom that you have for us and our listeners? You did ask earlier about getting the dog to Panama. What we had done originally, because we'd heard horror stories about trying to fly in and out of Panama City with the dog, we took a we were in Boco del Toro, Panama, and we took a bus up to Costa Rica and flew in and out of there, and had no problems with the dog doing that. Oh, okay. So again, that stuff we learned from Seven Seas bulletins. You know, people told us how to how to make it work. All right, great. Great for the yeah, seven seas. To, to elaborate on that just a little bit, um, in, if we'd flown in and out of Panama City, which was where we'd had gone to get a flight back to the States, it was like a three or four hundred dollar charge for them to clear the dog. Wow. And at the, the border between Costa Rica and Panama, they could care less. So we walked him across the border. We took a bus up, and everybody got off the bus, passed through customs. We took the dog with us, walked through customs and uh, immigration on both sides, got back on the bus and made it up to the airport, flew home. And then with the new one coming back, we kept him in a little travel uh, uh, bag, bag you know, or kennel. And uh, same thing coming back, no questions, you know, have a good time. He, he even got petted once. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but that's the type of thing that, and I think we even wrote that up in SSA when we did it. Uh, but And we heard about it from somebody else through that. So sharing those stories uh, helps other people and it wasn't breaking the law or anything it's just that in Panama City the corruption right because it has a way of doing it but, and that's the other thing while you're out cruising is you want to keep an ear out to what is corrupt and what's not and try to avoid the corruption right don't don't fall that's into it or yeah try to buy your way out and that sort of thing that's a good one too. Yes, and we have a we have a a story, um, a little similar with uh, getting our skipper key. We got uh, in Fiji. You know, it's strictly forbidden to have the dog ashore in Fiji, and we were getting a new puppy um, from Australia. So okay, well, there's no problem because no rabies or anything like that, and. Uh, it was kind of funny in the end that Australia was more problems letting the dog out of Australia than it was <laughs> to get the dog into Fiji because what that we arranged is that we would anchor near at the anchorage near the airport. They had a vet come meet the dog and our fr our friends were coming to stay with us on the boat so they came accompanying the dog and the vet met them came directly on board and we were already checked out and so they from there we just went off to Vanuatu where 
it was the most sensible sensible handling of pets that we had ever witnessed and that was that if you had papers that your dog had your shots and the dog was you know had gone to the vet like most anybody would ever do with their dog then they said okay they sprinkled a little tick powder on him said okay <laughs> he can go ashore now so yeah. that's, that's how we handled that kind of thing so there are ways to do it and they're worth it and they're worth it right yeah but you gotta investigate it and ask questions and uh, you know educate yourself to it right right and lots of opportunity are. for education <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, so thank you so much for that great interview, and we've enjoyed it so much, and it's nice to talk to other Skipper Key enthusiasts, especially, and pet lovers, and uh, thanks so much for that uh, interview, and we wish you good luck on your, your staying in the desert now, now that you've... Uh, got the dust under your feet and then uh, Bruce is gliding around in the air and uh, thank you so much and we wish you so much luck on your continuation and fun with Zach okay thank you If you enjoyed this interview, make sure to listen to our other guests in the series, subscribe to SSA YouTube channel, access the MP3 audio recording on SSA website, get the scoop on the latest SSA activities and benefits, read the latest cruiser bulletin, participate in the forum and Facebook group, and please, promote our organization to who you think might benefit. <laughs>